Welcome, my name's Deborah Walker, and I'm speaking to you from Revival from Down Under, which is a Christian church located in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne, Australia. So I'd like to welcome you all here today and those watching online. And my heart is that uh, wherever people are meeting in his name, that he would be in the midst and that he would be glorified and he loves it when we gather to him. So unto him shall the gathering of the people be. So he said, if we lift him up, he will draw all men unto himself. So praise the Lord and wherever people are gathered, may they just be blessed, blessed by our loving Heavenly Father. And today I'd like to speak on a topic that I've called, How Much Does God Love You? How much does God love you? And let me first say that really God does love you. And the Almighty God, He created all things and He created you. And God has a wonderful plan for everyone and everything in this world. And God's plan is found in the book, the Bible. And the Bible contains God's words written down so that you can know, understand, love and worship your creator. And God is love and God is also pure and holy. He is peace. He's joy. He's good to all. He's kind. He's slow to anger. He's forgiving. He's merciful. He's just, honest, and he cannot lie. So everything you said in this word is the truth. And he's, he is also wonderful. And he's the counselor. He's the everlasting father, the prince of peace, and the mighty God. And he is also light. And in him is no darkness at all. And love needs expression. So the Godhead, who is God the Father, God the Word, God the Holy Spirit, created this world and all things, including mankind. And the following scriptures that we're going to look at today reveal God's love and special plan and gift for you. All right, so let's start in the beginning with God's creation. Let's turn, to, I'm opening my King James Bible to Genesis chapter 1. And in verse 1, and we read here, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And then God created land, sea, grass, trees, plants, lights as being the sun, moon and stars, fish, birds, animals and man. And verse 27, and it says, And God, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Praise God. And verse 31, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. And chapter 2, verse 15, let's read there. It says, and the Lord God, so after he'd made man, the Lord God took man and he called him Adam. And he put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And, you know, God, he loved and wanted to protect his creation. So he gave God commands. So he gave Adam commands and instructions to follow. All right. And then we read of uh, Satan's deception. There was another being in the garden called Satan. And he's also known as the devil. And he is a fallen angel from heaven who displeased God. And in Genesis chapter 3, verse 4 and 5, it says, He's also known as the serpent. And the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die. For God does know that in the day that you eat thereof, this is of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, then your eyes shall be opened and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Satan lied and he deceived Eve. And verse 6, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also to her husband with her and he did eat. 
It, it appealed to her flesh. And even though Adam had been told not to eat of the tree, he disobeyed God. And so Adam and Eve disobeyed God's command, God's instruction. And this is actually called sin. And verse 9, let's read. And the Lord God called Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Sin brings fear, separation from God, and ultimately eternal death. And if we turn over to Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 5, and we read here in verse 12, Wherefore by one man, speaking of Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed unto all men, for that all have sinned. So why do people sin? Let's turn back to Mark chapter 7 and verse 21. And it says here, and this is what Jesus said, For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications. Both those are having sexual intimacy with someone other than your spouse, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and they defile the man. So every decision a person makes is motivated by what is in their heart. And to help us understand what sin is, First, we need to understand that God is perfect and he has perfect standards, otherwise known as the Ten Commandments. And I'm just going to turn back to Exodus chapter 20. And we're going to read them. Exodus 20. And the, we know them as the Ten Commandments. And let's start in verse 1. It says here, and God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Now, verse 3, this is the first commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. The second commandment, verses 4 to 6, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of men that love me and keep my commandments. The third commandment, verse 7. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that takes his name in vain. Number 4, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God, and in it thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord God made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. The fifth commandment, verse 12. Honour thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord God giveth thee. The sixth commandment, verse 13. Thou shalt not kill. The seventh commandment, verse 14. Thou shalt not commit adultery. The eighth commandment, verse 15. Thou shalt not steal. The ninth commandment. Thou shalt not bear false witness, that's lie, against thy neighbour. And the 10th commandment, verse 17, Thou shalt not cover thy neighbour's house, thou shalt not cover thy neighbour's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbour's. And God is perfect, and so are his standards. And an easy way to remember the Ten Commandments is using the following phrase, specifically the capital letters. So I have my board here. 
So I've got here the Ten Commandments. And this is the phrase I'm going to suggest that we, it helps us remember the Ten Commandments. It says, gives FM radio to Massel. Gives FM radio to Massel. But by using the capital letters of this phrase, we're just going to refresh what we just read there. The G equals God. Right? We're to have no other gods. There is only one true God. One true God. The I equals idols. Idols are anything that come before God, that have preeminence in our life before God. V is vain. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord in vain. That means not to use it as a swear word like Jesus Christ or Jesus people or um, um, Christ, you know, Christ. You know, that's a swear word. If we're going to talk to the Lord, then we talk to him. But we don't use his name as a swear word. S is for Sabbath. And Sabbath means rest. And God was saying to keep a day holy. But I'm saying that every day we should be in the rest of faith and every day should be holy. But God certainly meant us to put time aside every week where we can be and spend time with God. But I'm also suggesting that's a daily thing. And the New Testament church, they met on the first day of the week, which is the Sunday. So that's why churches these days meet on a Sunday and more often if possible. The FM, that stands for Father and Mother. Father and mother, all right, we're to honour our father and mother. That means we are to value them. We are to respect them. They gave us life. And God's promise is that when we do that, we are then guaranteed long life. Comes with that promise. The M equals to murder. God doesn't want us to murder anybody. But also we know in the scripture it says to hate is to murder. These things are in our heart. So we just, God doesn't want them in our heart. Uh, A is adultery. All right, that's having sexual intimacy with someone or someone else's spouse or whoever your, that in sexual intimacy is somebody that you are not married to. And so that also includes fornication. All right, if you're not married to that person then you have nothing to do with sexual intimacy with that person. S equals to steal. All right? We're not to steal. We're not to take something without permission. These are God's standards. Some people just think, oh, I'll just take this. I need it more than them. No, God said, you shall not steal. L is lie. We must always tell the truth not an option back of the book back of the bible says all lies are going to the lake of fire so we don't want any kind of lie including white lies coming out of our mouth all right we must always speak the truth and e i've called that envy the um the test the commandment says covet but people covet things because they're envious of what others have so we don't want to be coveted and covet what other people have. If people have other things, well, then we need to be happy for them. And if God blesses them, well, then God can bless you. And God said, whatever you need, ask, believing, you shall receive. And so God loves his people. And so we can just go to God and ask him. All right. And he does. If we delight ourselves in him, he said he would give us the desires of our heart. So that's an easy way to remember. It gives FM radio to Massel. Hope that helps. All right. Praise God. All right. And then, you know, looking at all those things, we can understand that everyone has done something wrong in thought, word or deed. And therefore, they automatically disqualify themselves from being eligible to going to heaven. However, God is love, as I said, and God desires everyone to reach heaven and for no one to miss out. And the next scripture shows is 2 Peter, chapter 3. 2 Peter, 
chapter 3 and verse 9. And we read here, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Repentance means to change their ways. And God does not want you to perish. However, because God is holy and pure, he will not allow sin into heaven. He has therefore made it very clear in his word who he will allow into heaven. And I'll just read the scripture says in Ezekiel 18 verse 4, Behold, all, so all souls are mine, says the Lord. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. All right? Sin brings death. And because of man's heart, no one could keep those Ten Commandments. So everyone, that's you and me included, everyone is disqualified from going to heaven. And if we just turn back to Romans chapter 3. And verse 23, it says here, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've come short of God's standards. Why? Because of sin. And again, everyone has done something wrong in thought, word or deed. And because there's no one perfect, that sin nature, because of Adam's sin, that sin nature has passed through the bloodstream and it reveals itself in four ways. Sin... And that means to err, to miss the mark, to go astray and to fall. Iniquity, that's perverseness in spirit, vanity, unrighteousness and wickedness. Number three, transgression, that's rebellion, lawlessness, deceive, trespass and violate. And number four, uncleanness, that's foulness, defiled morally and physically. All right. However, Jesus Christ is our substitute. To be clear, God is holy, righteous and pure. And it is our sin that brings death and separation from God and stops us from going from, to heaven. Sin, therefore, must be dealt with. Sin must be removed from us if we're to have access to God and heaven. As I said, man is imperfect. And because sin is passed through the bloodstream of males, man cannot do anything that makes him acceptable and worthy enough before God. We can't. It's because it's in our heart. We are unacceptable in our fallen state. And so how much does God love you? Enough to send Jesus Christ, his son, to die for you. That's how much he loves you. So what did God do? The Godhead had a wonderful plan and the only way for man to receive forgiveness of sins would be by the shedding of sinless blood. So one out of the Godhead who was sinless willingly offered to pay the price for the sin of the world. God the Word said he would come and be born in the earth. So God the Word in order to become God's son in the earth was conceived by God the Father and born of Mary a virgin. And he was given the name Jesus and Jesus would then grow up and be named Jesus Christ and tell people about God, his father, who loves them, who loves people. And Jesus Christ, as an innocent man, would then go to the cross to take the punishment of man's sin upon himself. And Jesus Christ, he had done nothing wrong. He was sinless and pure because he was the middle one from the Godhead. He was the God-man. And Jesus Christ, he obeyed his father's commands, which meant being the ultimate sacrifice for you and me. So at the age of 33 and a half years old, Jesus was spat on, beaten, his beard was plucked, a crown of long thorns pierced his head, and he was viciously whipped. And by the whipping he bore for you and me, it tore flesh off his back, and by doing so, he carried every pain, sickness and disease, just so you do not have to. Jesus was so beaten and disfigured that his visage was marred more than any man. Let's turn to Isaiah 52. And we read here. 
Isaiah 52 and verse 14. And it says here, As many were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than any, more than the sons of men. Jesus was then crucified, which means nails were pierced through his hands and his feet to secure him to the wooden cross. And even so, although nails pinned Jesus to the cross, it was his love for you that kept him there. And meanwhile, being crucified is the most excruciating way a person can die. Why? Because when one hangs on a cross, their lungs, they slump down. And so because Jesus' back was so viciously whipped, for him to get one breath, he had to push up on his nailed feet, push up to open his lungs and rub his torn, shredded back against that wooden cross just to get one breath. And he did that for six horrendous hours. And it was prophesied of Jesus in Isaiah 53, verses 4 to 6, it says here, Surely he who has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And speaking of Jesus, I'm just going to turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. And it says here, Verse 24, 1 Peter 2, 24, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. That's the cross. That we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. All right, so by Jesus going to the cross, there's healing available and there's cancellation of sin available, forgiveness of sins. And so all this, happened to Jesus until he was almost unrecognizable as a man. And after being crucified, Jesus was then buried for three days and three nights and then rose from the dead and was seen by many. Hallelujah. His impact on the world was enormous like no other man. In fact, the current calendar today is dated BC, meaning before Christ, and AD, Anno Domini, meaning the year of our Lord. Our calendar to this day was changed because of the life of Jesus Christ. And if we turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it says here in verses 3 and 4, speaking of Jesus, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And why did Jesus do that? Because he loves you and he loves me. And let's turn back to Romans chapter 6. And we read here in verse 23, For the wages, that's the payment of sin, is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Hallelujah. And Romans 5 well, I was just going to say, Jesus Christ, he sacrificed his life and died for you as your substitute so that you can receive God's forgiveness of all your sins and to be healed of all, of all your sicknesses if you believe, right? It's got to believe and believing comes from your heart, not from your head, from your heart. And Romans 8 verse 5, it says, but God commends his loves towards us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us, right? We didn't even know him. We didn't, he was born all those years ago, right? And we're in this generation, but God is all knowing and he can look all the way down time and he knows all about you. He knows all about your life. He knows what's gone down in your life and he loves you. He loves you. And if we turn back to John chapter three,
And not only does he just love you, he loves the whole world. John 3, verse 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son, Jesus, into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And that word saved, it means to be delivered, protected, healed, preserved, to do well and to be made whole. God wants to make our lives whole. But sin causes us to perish. Sin destroys our lives. And Jesus, he took the punishment of your sin when he died on the cross. So you can receive eternal life if you believe. And I'm just going to turn back to 2 Peter 3 again, verse 9. And it says here, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's God's will. He wants all people to come to repentance. And so what does repentance mean? Repentance means to have regret about the things that we've done and decide not to continue in the wrongdoing. And to have a change of our ways, to turn from our own ways and turn to God, turn away from sin and turn towards God and follow in the ways of God. And once we do that, restoration is available. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 18. And verse 11. And it says here, for the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. You know, we may not be physically lost. You know, we know we're seated or where we're living and so forth. But if we are in sin, we are lost in sin. Right? Lost is not just a location thing. It's what we are, who we are. We can be lost in sin. And Jesus said in John 14, 6, that I, he is the way, the truth and the life. And no man can come to the Father except through him. Jesus is the only mediator between man and God. No one can come to the Father. You can't get to the God, you can't get to heaven through Mary or Buddha or any other thing that's called God. Jesus is the only way to heaven. And in John 10, 10, Jesus said here, He said, the thief comes not, but the thief, speaking of the devil, comes not but to steal and to kill and destroy. That's what he comes to do. The devil comes to um, steal from our life. He steal our happiness, steal our wealth, steal our well-being, steal our futures. He comes to destroy our relationships, our lives, our bodies, and eventually kill us if he can, ultimately to separate us from God. And to kill us is to... Um, just to give us total separation so that we don't make it to heaven. But then it goes on to say, and Jesus said, but he has come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. All right, Jesus came to give you life. No matter what your situation is, God wants to rescue you, save you out of your life, out of your current circumstances and give you the true life. The true life, you know, lives are incomplete. On the inside, there's something missing. People go after all manner of things, trying to fill that void. If only I had more of this, or if only I had or another relationship, or more money, or more material things. They're trying to fill it up, and they can't. They're not meant to. All those things, and relationships are good, and material things are useful, and, and money is helpful, but they do not satisfy the heart of man. Only God. That's the way we're made. And that's how God makes it that way so that we will turn to him and find him. And it says here in Acts chapter 2, verse 21. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. All right. Imagine if you were um, out at sea and in the boat and somehow a big wave came and it crashed the boat and over you went over the side, no life jacket, and you are, dr you are sinking down fast, all right? You're sinking, you are drowning, you are drowning. So what are you going to do? You can see something in the distance there. What are you going to do? You're going to call, help, 
You're going to call. Of course you are. If not, you're going to drown. Well, that's what I'm saying. People are actually drowning in sin. And this scripture says we need to call out to God so that we can get saved. All right? You have to call. You can't just, oh, he knows, he knows. No, it says here we have to call. Call on the name of the Lord to be saved. And so that word saved means to be delivered from destruction, death, the consequences of sin and admission to heaven brought about through Jesus Christ's sacrifice. And Romans chapter 4, Romans chapter 2, Romans chapter 2 and verse 4. It's here, says here, or despise thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that it's the goodness of God that leads thee to repentance. You know, God is working in your life right now to draw you to himself. That's why you're hearing this today, right? God is trying to reach out to you and draw you to himself. And in Acts chapter 3, verse 19, we read here. Repent ye therefore and turn, repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing come from the presence of the Lord. Repent, that means to turn away from sin and turn towards God. All right, so that your sins can be blotted out, just erased. And Romans 10. Verses 8 to 10, it says, But what says thee? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thine heart. That is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So it has to be in our heart and in our mouth. And just reading on verse 11, it says, For the scripture says, Whosoever believes on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There it is. Call upon the Lord and you shall be saved. And in Colossians, verse 1, chapter 1, Colossians, just after Philippians, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 14, speaking of Jesus, it says here, in whom we have redemption through the blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Hallelujah. Redemption, that means a deliverance from sin and damnation. We've been purchased back. He, you know, it's only through Jesus Christ that we can be purchased away from sin and damnation. And Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 7, it says here, in her, speaking of Jesus, in whom we have redemption through the blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Right? Grace is God's undeserved favor. We, don't even, we do not even deserve his grace and mercy and his goodness. We did nothing to deserve it. We're in sin, but it's because of his great love. But if he can just reach us with his word and cause that word to bring faith in our heart, to believe what I'm saying today, God wants to rescue us from a life of sin and an eternity in hell. And Ephesians chapter uh, 1, verse 7, we just read that. And then Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4, it says, But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherein he loved us. I mean, here we are, we're reading about the love of God. He loves you. He loves you. And 1 John chapter 1, just right down the back, 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, it says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Scripture says all unrighteousness is sin and unrighteousness is wrongdoing. You know when you've done things wrong. It's about dishonest ways. It's about wickedness. That's unrighteousness. And so what's God wanting to do for you? He wants to offer you a new beginning to start afresh. You know, so many people say, I've done so many things wrong in my life. If only I could start over. 
Well, that's what God is offering you today, a new beginning. And God says in Hebrews 8, and when we go his way, what will he do? It says in Hebrews 8, verse 12, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. You know, you could have be aware of one sin or one trillion sins. One or one trillion will separate you from God. You know, you might think, well, I'm not as bad as some. It doesn't matter. Sin is sin. There is no grading of sin. Sin is sin. And we have all sinned. And it says in Psalm 103 verse 12, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions, our sins from us. That's what God wants to do. He wants to take, remove those sins out of your heart and put them right as far as east is from west, never to be remembered. And once your sins are forgiven, God no longer remembers them or records them. Because at the moment, there's a list beside your name of everything in your life that's going on. He knows all about your life. I'm just calling it a list. God knows all things about your life. But God wants to erase that whole list. And it says in Isaiah 1 verse 18, Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, that's red, they shall be white as snow. And though they be red like crispin, they shall be as wool. So God wants to take our mess and make it beautiful and white. And Ephesians, just so to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. And it says here, For by grace, that's his undeserved favour, are you saved through faith, not through religion, but through faith and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. You know, you cannot work for, self, for your salvation. You need, you need to believe that Jesus Christ paid the price for your salvation. It is a free gift for you to receive. Everybody likes to receive a, a gift like we have birthdays or special occasions and people receive gifts. And those things, as wonderful as they are, are only temporary. But what God is offering you tonight or today is the free gift of eternal life that will never perish. And Ephesians chapter 2 verse 5, and it says here, even when we were dead in our sins, has quickened us together with Christ, for by grace are you saved. He's quickened us. It means he, he wants to make us alive. Sin makes us dead, dead in trespasses and sin, but his grace, when we turn to him, makes us alive, spiritually alive. And Romans chapter 1, it says here, because once you're saved, it says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God, unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also the Greek. God wants everybody to come to faith and believe the gospel, believe the truth, believe this good news. And you know, it's not enough to just know about God and religion just knows about God. God requires you to be born again and to be born again, it happens in your heart. Religion serves God from their head. But to be born again, it's a conversion that happens in your heart. And 1 Peter chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 23, it says, Being born again, not of corruption, seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which lives and abide forever. God is offering you a new start a new beginning, being born again spiritually on the inside, born again. And what happens when we're born again? Colossians chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13, it says, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. There's only two kingdoms, God's kingdom and the devil's kingdom. And when we're in the devil's kingdom and in sin, 
That's the kingdom we're in. But when God, when we call out to God and give our lives to him, he rescues us. He delivers us out of the kingdom of darkness and brings us into the kingdom of light. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. And then 2 Corinthians 5, we read here. And verse 17, what happens once we do that? Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, a new creation. Old things are passed away and behold, all things become new. God wants to give you a future and all that's gone down in your life. He just wants to let you to leave it behind and start anew with him in your life and give your life to him. And so and when you're truly born again, you no longer desire to do the things that are displeasing to the Lord. All right. When you're born again, you have a reverential fear of God and you want to do things right. Not dishonest, not lying, not cheating or stealing. You want to do things right because that's good fruit and you'll change. If you're born again, there'll be a change and it'll be evident to people that know you. You'll know. You'll know the difference. You'll go, oh, I don't want to do that anymore or Oh, no, I'm not going to say that. You know, there'll be a change. So God is offering you a new beginning, a fresh start. But this time, not by yourself and in your own strength. This time with God's help, living your life his way, following his commands, his instructions as written in the Bible and allowing him to be Lord of your life. He doesn't just want to be savior. He wants to be Lord. There's a difference. Lord is, he's the boss. He's the master. And we are to serve him. Not just know about him, but to serve him. Not just to be saved by him, but to serve him. And what has Jesus promised? Hebrews 13. And verse 5. And it says here, just the last bit, it says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. That means abandon thee. All right, God's not, Jesus is not going to abandon you. And the Amplified, verse 5 at the end there, it says, I will not in any way fail you, nor give you up, nor leave you without support. I will not, I will not, I will not in any degree leave you helpless, nor forsake you, let you down, relax my hold on you, assuredly not. That is God's promise to you. Once you go God's way, he's there. All right. He will always be there to help you no matter what's going on. He will be there to help. Just call out to him. And so God desires to blot out all the sins of your past and give you a future. And his love for you is so great that in exchange for all your sins, transgressions, iniquities and the guilt that goes with your current life, he will give you peace in your heart and mind and eternal life. So what about you? Let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30. And we just read here in verse 19 and 20, it says, this is what the Lord says. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life that both thou and thy seed may live, that thou mayest love the Lord thy God and that thou mayest obey his voice, his voice is his word, and that thou mayest cleave unto him, for he is thy life and the length of thy days, that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord God swear unto your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, to give them. Praise God. So right now, where do you stand before God? Is your life right with him? Is there sin in your life separating you? from a holy and just God. If this was your final moment and you took your last breath, would you make it to heaven? Will you receive God's free gift of salvation? Again, the Bible says all have sinned and come short of God's glory. And it's sin that's in our heart and shows itself in the ways we think, what we say, what we do. And it separates us from God. 
but we want you to know that God loves you so very much that he sent Jesus Christ to take the punishment of your sin. And Jesus, although he'd done nothing wrong, he took your place and your judgment by dying the most painful of deaths when he died on the cross. He was then buried and then he was raised from the dead three days later and seen by many. And so to receive God's free gift of salvation of Jesus Christ, you need to do four things. Number one, admit you're a sinner, that there's sin and you need a saviour. Number two, be willing to turn from your sins and ask God to forgive you. Number three, believe that Jesus Christ died for you on the cross and rose from the grave. And number four, invite Jesus to be your saviour and Lord of your life. And as we read before, Romans 10, 13, it says, For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So I want you to know that there's a heaven to gain and a fiery hell to lose. And only by getting your life right with God and continuing to live right with God will you make it to heaven. Or you might know that you're not in the place with God that you should be. You used to be full on for the God, but now you're not serving him as you should. And you've let other things steal your relationship with God and you want to come back to him right now. Remember, I was just going to say also, if you're unsure if you're saved, the devil's always trying, lying to you and telling you you're not saved. So right now, you too can make sure that you're saved. You know, Jesus, he stood openly on a cross with his arms outstretched wide just to prove how much he loves you. He did that for you. As I said, if you were the only person in the world, Jesus Christ still would have come and suffered the crucifixion. That is how valuable you are to him. He died for you. Uh, let's all stand. Thank you. It's uh, decision time. And today is the day of salvation. And that means now. You've heard a lot. And so if you fall into any of those three categories, your life's not right with God and you want to receive his forgiveness or you've moved away from God and you want to come back to him or three or if you're unsure whether you're saved or not and you want to be sure this day. And if that's you and God is speaking to your heart right now, if you are sincere before God, God will hear your prayer. So this is your decision time. And to receive God's free gift of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and to make a fresh start today by surrendering your life to him, then say the following prayer aloud after me. And as you believe and say this prayer sincerely from your heart, God will hear you, forgive you and cleanse away all your sin. So let's all close our eyes and pray. Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I confess that I have sinned against you and others. I am sorry for everything I have done wrong and I ask you to forgive me. I believe Jesus Christ took all my sins and sicknesses upon himself when he died on the cross for me and rose again on the third day. Lord, you said in your word that if I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus 
and I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead, I will be saved. So Father, right now, I give you my life and I confess Jesus Christ is my Lord, my Saviour and my Healer who died for me and then rose from the dead. Lord, just as you have forgiven me, I choose to forgive every person who has ever harmed or wronged me. Thank you, thank you, Lord, for your love, forgiveness, mercy, and giving me eternal life. Amen. You can open your eyes. Hallelujah. As a minister of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you said that prayer sincerely from your heart, I announce that your sins are forgiven. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Congratulations. That's so wonderful. So wonderful. Praise God. Praise God. Well done. Well done. I'll just, just say a few more things just while you're standing. Welcome to the family of God. God loves you and so do we. And if you said that prayer, we'd like you to let us know and you can send us an email at info at rfdu. That's standing for revival from down under rfdu.com. And God's word says to the praise in Ephesians 1 verse 6, to the praise and glory of his grace, his favor and mercy, wherein he has made us accepted in the beloved. So you are now accepted and belong to God's family. You are have an eternal father who loves you unconditionally and you have a brother, Jesus Christ, who has already proved his love for you and you are also part of God's worldwide family of believers. Hallelujah. He has believers in every nation. Hallelujah. It's a big family. And so salvation is just the beginning of your walk with God. So please be seated. So... It's just the beginning. So that prayer is just the beginning, that fresh start. But, you know, God wants you to grow in his ways. And uh, we would uh, encourage you to do the following. Number one would be every day, talk to the Lord. He wants a relationship with you, not religion. He wants relationship. He wants you to talk to him. He wants you to tell, you about, tell him about your situation, what's going on. Pray, talk to him, um, talk about things, ask him. It's all okay. You know, it's about having a relationship with him and not religion. Number two, every day, read your Bible. If you don't have a Bible, get with someone who does. Or you can look, at the, look on the Bible on our website, rfdu.com. We have a King James Bible there that you can read online. It's also paralleled with Amplified Bible. And, you know, you need the Word of God to feed your spiritual man. Just like you feed your natural man, natural food. Well, your spiritual man, he feeds on the Word of God. And if you want to be strong in God... You get into the word and it'll en en enrich you, encourage you, direct you, strengthen you. And God will show you his ways and his great plan for your life. Hallelujah. Number three, every week attend church. You know, you need to be in church so you can learn and grow in the ways of God and receive communion. Jesus said, do this as often and receiving communion. We do it every week and we, in fact, we do it more often here than that. But at least every week receive communion and give tithes. That's to honor God for all the increase. That's 10% of your increase into your life and offerings. God wants us to bring offerings, financial offerings, supporting the gospel. Hallelujah. Supporting the church because it's, um, it's just God's way. And we have to be trained like God loves you that he gave or well, God wants us to love him. And part of that loving him is that we are trained to be givers. And money speaks a lot about people's hearts. But if God's your Lord, it's not a problem at all. Because you love him, you will want to give to the gospel and do things right with your money before him. Number four, get water baptized. That's full immersion in water. Jesus was fully immersed. We are to follow him. And get filled with the Holy Spirit. Be baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. You need the Holy Spirit because this is a spiritual book. And the Holy Spirit will give you revelation, understanding and lead and guide you into understanding God's word. And the Holy Spirit is the empowerment to help you walk the walk. 
right? Jesus never meant you to do it in your own strength. He said when he was going back to the heaven, he said, I'm going back to the Father, but I'm going to send you the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's a gift. Salvation's a gift. The Holy Spirit's a gift. God wants you to have the gift of the Holy Spirit. And if you're not familiar with that, you can speak to a pastor about that and they'll give you understanding and pray for you to receive the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. And number five, be around strong Christians who will encourage and strengthen you in your walk with the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. So may the Lord God who loves you so very much bless you and guide you and protect you every day as you live your new life in him. And everyone said, Amen.